Hello, everybody. Yes. So my name is Chris Cook. I'm hoping that you can hear me because, of course, as, as Kwame said, this is a, a, a different ultimate seminar because we're all coming from our own homes <laughs> this time rather than gathering in central London, which, uh, you know, is a shame. Although there are pros and cons, aren't there? Because just looking at the, the conversation that's going on in the chat, um, there are clearly people tuning in from all over the world. So, so the, 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 the downside of 2020 is we have to do all this online. It means we can't all be in the same room at the same time. But the massive upside is that there are literally people from all over the world tuning in today. And that is really great that everybody, wherever you are, can uh, get the, uh, the, 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 the advantage, the skills, the knowledge, the insights, the connections that this event always offers you. So, yes, um, very quickly, I'm going to give you a 20 second introduction to me because we've got so much to cover and we've just over an hour to go. Um, but my name is Chris Cook. As, as Kwame said, I run a business here in London called CMU. We say our job is to help people navigate and understand the music business. And we do that through our daily email bulletin, the CMU Daily, our weekly podcast set list. We have lots of guides you can access online. We have lots of training courses that we offer. We do lots of research and consultancy. So that's what we do at CMU. And so the job of this panel, knowing your business, is to help you as music makers, as people who aspire to have a career in music, whether that's on stage or behind the scenes, to know the business, to be able to navigate and understand the music industry. And I have got five great panelists joining me today. Um, I'm going to get them all to introduce themselves in a moment. But before we do that, a quick logistical thing, which is that I have so many questions I want to ask these guys over the next hour and seven minutes. But actually, your questions are more important. So if you're tuning in via Zoom, then you can click on the Q&A button, the double bubble button at the bottom of the screen and type some questions in. Or if you're on YouTube, you can use a little uh, interactive window there to put your questions in. And at some point over the next hour, we will start pulling in your questions. Uh, some I will just read out. But uh, for those of you within the Zoom platform, we might actually turn on your mics and get you to ask the questions yourself. So as, you, as questions come to mind, click on that Q&A button or type into the the YouTube window and get your questions into the list. We probably won't have time to answer them all, unfortunately, but we'll try and answer as many as we can. Okay, uh, let's get my panel online. So I'm going to introduce them each in turn. And as they turn on their video and their mic, I'm going to ask them to just give us an incredibly quick CV. Okay, because we've got some great people coming from different strands of the industry. That's the important thing about this panel. We're not just talking about recordings. We're not just talking about live. We're not just talking about publishing. We're going to talk about all of those things over the next hour. So I'm going to get each of our panelists to turn on their cameras in turn and just say hello and give us that 90 second, maybe two minute update of their career to date. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to get David first. David from WME coming from the live side of the business. So um, if David wants to turn on his camera and yeah, give, give us that very quick two minute introduction to uh, your career and how you got to the role you're in today. Thanks, Chris and Kwame. Um, so, yeah, I'm David Levy. I work here in a talent agency called WME, which is part of a bigger entertainment company called Endeavour. I've been a, an agent for some 35 years or so. Um, uh, the role of an agent is these days more complicated than it used to be, but essentially you are planning out the live career for an artist. You decide, helping them decide on where to play, when to play, how much the ticket should be, what they should be compensated for, um, and all kinds of other sort of creative control aspects that go along with a, a, a live career. And you're trying to develop that career in a way where it, it, it continues to prosper over many years. Um, you know, playing live is something you can do well beyond your recording career. Um, you know, in those 35 years, I've, I've done many different aspects of the industry, and I think that's really important. Um, but I started off making the tea and um, carrying bits of paper from one side of the room to the other and just sort of grabbing a phone when I was allowed to. I think my first actual client was either Tipper Irie or Smiley Culture back in the day. Um, and uh, since then, I've, I've worked at a number of agencies over the years, but um, some of the clients have taken the journey with me. So my oldest relationships are with people like Fatboy Slim, Bjork, Massive Attack, uh, all of whom have been clients for 20, 25 years. And then some of my newer clients would be um, people like Dua Lipa. Um, and uh, I, I work with a lot of DJs in the electronic space, but over the years I've done hip hop, rap, reggae, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, generally it's a, a question of 
finding music and artists that make the music that you really sort of feel impassioned about and feel you can make a difference to. And then, um, you know, getting in very early and helping them sort of develop a strategy for whatever their own sort of ideas around performing live happen to be. Um, and it's taken me all around the world and it's, uh, you know, been an extraordinary uh, journey, which is far from over. These days, because I work a, in a much larger American owned agency, we also do film, TV, literary, I mean, you name an area of entertainment, um, we're involved in it. And so we're structured not unlike record companies. We have different departments that do different functions and they're quite highly integrated. Uh, would that do, Chris? That's perfect. Fantastic. Good overview of how you got to now and uh, what your how an agency works. And we'll probably come back a little bit later to the ins and outs of, of what it is that you're doing with the artists that you work with. But let's get our next panelist to turn on their video now and, and do the same incredibly speedy, uh, about two minutes, if possible, intro to your career to date. So let's get Eve next, um, who actually she works at Cobalt, but also works on the recording side of Cobalt's business. So does publishing stuff with Cobalt and recording stuff with AWOL. So let's get Eve to do a very quick intro to her career to date. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Um, so my career to date, um, so I, I actually grew up in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, so that's where I went to school and started. And then um, I sort of decided I got to get out of Edinburgh. I've got to move to London and um, pursue music. So I, I came down to London and studied music production at a, a college called the ACM, which is just outside of London. And um, so I studied music production there, loved it, loved being in the studio around artists. Um, at that point, I didn't really know about the industry. I didn't know about jobs within the industry. Um, but I went to a panel similar to this and learned about a &R. And that was something that just really excited me and was became something I wanted to pursue. So that was back in around like 2011. Um, and I started sort of reach out, do internships, work experience. And I managed to um, get a job at Cobalt Scouting. So whilst I was at uni, I started scouting, going to gigs and then, um, I was lucky enough to be employed full time after I finished uni and I've, I worked my way up throughout Cobalt from then and, and built a roster and became an A&R manager and I'm now a senior A&R manager on the publishing side there. Um, my roster on the publishing side includes artists um, like Coffee and Chronix, Mahalia, um, to name a few and um, more recently this year I've moved over to the record side like Chris said so I'm also a senior a &R on the record side of the Cobalt recordings business called AWOL um, and my roster on that side includes Little Sims, um, it also includes Hack Baker and Tamara and it's also a roster that I'm building on the record side so yeah that's me. Fantastic. Okay. So yes. And um, so he was able to talk about both uh, how you structure the recording side of what you do as an artist, but also the songwriting side, because it's important to remember that actually the music industry treats the songwriting process and the recording process as two separate things, even though that can sometimes seem a little bit odd because you're often creating, composing, writing music, beats, lyrics, melody, whatever it is, and you're recording stuff at the same time. But the industry tends to treat those two things separately. So we have what we call music publishing, what we call the record industry. But uh, Eve cuts across too, because uh, Cobalt is, is, is very much in the publishing space and then the AWOL side of the business in recordings. Um, okay, uh, also in the recording side, let's get Moona next. So if you want to turn on your video from uh, the State 51 Conspiracy, and just very quickly explain, uh, say again, in two minutes, if you can do it, your career to date and what it is that you do at State 51. Hi, I'm Luna Eloa. I work at the State 51 Conspiracy. Um, the State 51, State 51 Conspiracy is an independent um, recorded music and media company. We were founded in 1997. Um, and basically we work with recorded music through distribution. We have an e-commerce platform, um, marketing, and we have a main focus on our application of ethical values in the music industry. Um, we worked with artists, established artists like Wire, um, Donovan, Guillemot, Sap, and then we work with a large roster of just emerging independent artists such as Fake Laugh, um, Niju, Creepy Neighbor. Um, so I work there and I help manage the label releases as well as the video production. Um, for the factory sessions that we do with some of the artists that we work with. 
um yeah that that's what i do <laughs> Fantastic. No, good, good, quick intro there. Um, so we're going to come to Crystal next, um, who uh, works at Columbia, which is part of Sony Music. So again, same question, just a pretty, very speedy overview of how you got to now and what it is that you're doing at Columbia. Thanks, Chris. Yes, I'm, I'm Crystal Keeby. I'm now at Columbia Records. Um, so I'm actually a legal and business affairs manager. So I sit on the legal side, but I'm also an a &R, So I, I kind of do both um, dual roles, which are interesting and Kind of the more that I sit in the label, the more I realise how they are actually intertwined. Um, prior to that, I was actually Mr. Easy's Global Legal Counsel for two and a half years. Um, and at the same time, I was also a corporate lawyer. So I was working in the corporate space and um, the corporate law space, working primarily on energy and infrastructure deals in Africa. So I was kind of doing both of those in tandem. I started them at the same time. I started both roles with Easy and with my last law firm in January 2017. Um, and with Easy, I did the deal with um, Universal Music Africa and then Columbia Records in the UK. And then I got headhunted over to Columbia to now sit in sit sit there. Um, and as a legal and business affairs manager, I kind of deal with all of the yeah the legal and business affairs of Columbia. So signing artists, dropping artists, clearing features, um, working across album rollouts. Um, and then in A and R, obviously it's just A and Ring and trying to find new talent. Um, I tend to focus more on R and B and Afro beats, sometimes some rap. Um, but um, yeah, that's my role. Fantastic. Yes, because I suppose it's in order sort of to navigate and understand the music business, there is the sort of the creative side of the business, the commercial side of the business, and then there's the legal and the rights side of the business. And they're all yes. interconnected. It's not that they're separate, but uh, we've tried on this panel to get people who can either bring a uh, different one of those perspectives, or actually you're probably finding with most of our panelists, they bring all of those perspectives to the table. Let's get our final panelist to introduce uh, herself. So Shawnee next, again, talking about rights and getting your rights sorted. That's what we're going to get your tips on in a moment. But before we do that, again, and same question, just give us the very speedy overview of how you got to now and what it is that you do. Sure, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Shawnee. Um, I have a company, The Go-To Agency, which is a publishing administration company and a royalty consultancy company. Um, I started off actually in the recorded side. Um, marketing, PR was my thing. I switched over to publishing after having my son because the recorded side of the business is not mum friendly at all. PRS was the only company that was nine to five that worked during my um, son's nursery hours. So I completely fell into this. But whilst I was at PRS, I just noticed like I'd been in the industry for five years and I knew nothing about royalties, publishing, like really important things to make sure that you're, you know, getting the most out of your uh, music. So um, after leaving PRS, I set up my business. Um, I did not make a bunch of money right away. So I took a job at Universal Music and I set out on a mission to learn everything I could about royalties across the board. So I worked in the royalties department. Fine enough, I can't wait for the Kanye discussion later because my job was to deal with the um, contracts and pay an account um, according to the recording agreements. Um, and then after leaving Universal, I just kind of went hard with my business and things are doing are going really well for me. Um, I also am a visiting lecturer at Hertfordshire University and as well as Westminster University. And um, it's kind of like my mission to educate the entire music community here in Jamaica as well on royalties and publishing. That's me in a nutshell. Fantastic. Big, big ambitious task you set yourself there. But we'll, yeah, we'll start that process today with all the hundreds of people tuning exactly. in um, right, to the cool. ultimate seminar. So um, what we're going to do uh, for the rest of this panel is we're going to spend a little bit of time just getting some practical tips for those of you who are music makers, your artists, you're creating music of how you can get the ball rolling. Because I think sometimes when you start out in a music career, and you're aware there's this thing called the music industry and there are labels and there are publishers and agents and promoters and managers. And you sort of feel, OK, in order to, to get my break, to make it in music, I need to get one of those people working for me. How do I get signed to a label, a promoter, a manager, an agency, etc.? But when you talk to people who work at those companies, what they'll usually tell you is that you need to get a bit of momentum going yourself. A label isn't going to sign you unless you're getting a bit of momentum around your recordings. An agent needs to see that you're doing some live activity. A publisher needs to see that you've got some songs and they're out there and something is happening. So it's all about getting things started for yourself. So we're just going to spend 10 minutes getting some practical tips on how you might do that. But then the other thing we're going to talk about today, which Shawnee alluded to there, is 
there have been a lot of debates about how the music industry works in 2020. I think COVID has put a lot of things under the spotlight. And you, if, if you read the music business press, if you read things like the CMU Daily, or indeed quite a lot of this, mainly because of Kanye West and Taylor Swift and uh, some other artists as well, these have been populating other media as well. So we're going to talk about some of the big debates that have been going on in the industry today. And just one last time to remind you, as we go, if you have any questions, if you're in the Zoom platform, click on the Q&A button. And if you're on YouTube, type them into the little interactive window, and we will make sure we get to your questions as well. But let's start off with the practical stuff. So I suppose if you're an artist making music, I mean, I think that you need to get your music out there. Um, but I mean, as Kwame said in, in the intro, we know that there are, I mean, the stat that came from Daniel Leck at Spotify is that there are 40,000 tracks being uploaded into Spotify every single day. And even if that, that's an exaggeration, we are definitely talking about hundreds of thousands of tracks every few months going into the system. So the challenge is how do you stand out? So I think I'm going to come to probably to, to, to Muna Net first and sort of say, you know, as somebody who is very much involved in that, working with both artists and labels on that, you know, how can artists make sure that their recordings are on all the right platforms, first of all. And then do you have any advice about, okay, I've got my music on Spotify and Apple. Maybe I've even got it on, you know, Tencent in China or Melon in South Korea. But how, how, what can you do to try and get people listening to the music? So any practical advice on getting your music out there and then get people streaming it? Uh, yeah, um, I think a big part of, obviously what we do at State 51 is we work in distribution. And so I think for self-release independent artists, I think finding the right distribution deal can help loads. Cause just like you said, I think it's very daunting. There's so much stuff out there, but the first step is probably just getting your music out there and making sure it's accessible and people can actually find you and listen to you. I think that's always the first step. Um, and so I think it depends on probably what stage people can be at with their music and you know, we work with, for example, at say 51, we have two different distribution deals. We have one that's, kind of an aggregation service that allows people to just get their music out there. We really believe that, you know, everyone should have the right to release music. Um, and then you have different deals that might be a little more hands-on, which I think is really beneficial to artists who are starting off. So working with a company who um, you have a team of people you can talk to and can help you work through the release period and the release stage of things having access to, let's say, um, advertising who can help ad advertise your releases on digital services and have connections with editorial teams on digital services. Um, I think this is definitely like a great starting point. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think my recommendation is always just, just maybe looking up distributors and getting in touch and seeing what's out there and, and speaking to different teams and seeing how people can help you in that. Yeah. Realm. And I guess part of that is understanding when it comes to getting your music online and this thing we call distribution is it's, there's a hierarchy of distribution. So yeah. what's brilliant about 2020 is that anyone can get their music on all the platforms. And we all know there's TuneCore, there's DistroKid, there's Ditto, there's all of those services. And definitely that's where you should start. But it's also being aware that there are then sort of the next layer up of distributors who don't just get your music on the platforms. Maybe they try and pitch it to playlisters. And then the next step up, maybe they don't just pitch it to playlisters. Maybe they are talking more proactively to the streaming services about opportunities. And obviously, you start out with the, with the basic DIY distribution. But it is looking for, you know, is there a company the next layer up that could help me get a little bit further on the streaming services? Definitely. And it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's just, I think, um, understanding that distribution, there are different layers and different deals within that. And so exactly that you can start off with something that is, like you said, straightforward, and you can upload your songs and get it out there. But it's also realizing that there are distributors out there, for example, us at State 51, who like to work closely with artists as well. Um, depending on, it's so dependent on who they are and what they're doing and how you know, they're marketing their releases and the work they're putting in themselves, but who are going to help you and try and get to the next stage of putting you in touch perhaps with the right people at services or helping you market releases in, in, in the best way. If we come to Eve next, and if you'll put your AWOL hat on, um, yeah. because the AWOL is co-op. And so what's interesting about AWOL is that AWOL does, it turns me talking about this being this distribution hierarchy. So there are those distributors who are just literally getting your music on the platforms 
all the way up to distributors who are pretty much doing everything a label would traditionally do. And what's fascinating about AWOL is you work at every single level on that. So with some artists, you're just doing distribution and some artists, you're actually throwing lots of different things on, on, on the table. But I mean, in, in terms of, you know, artists who maybe are at the, at the sort of the lower level at the moment, is there anything they could be doing themselves in terms of getting their music onto playlists or getting more people streaming the music that might make, you know, an AWOL interested in working with them on, on a more proactive level? Yeah, for sure. I mean, similar to what to what Muna said, the, the way that AWOL works is that sort of tiered system. So we have artists who are on just the basic platform. And what we really love is artists that then can move through those platforms. So as they start to build on the open platform, then we can put some funding behind um, and then eventually take it up to more of a full label services, sort of traditional label structure in terms of involvement. And something that I always, I guess, look for is if there is an artist who's on a AWOL open platform or on another distributor open platform, is just seeing that momentum that's building around them. It's not always about numbers or about, you know, Instagram following or all of that, but more just sometimes looking at that they're very active and collaborating with other artists or they're working with producers and they're just making stuff happen. And um, so for me, the, the main thing that I look for within that if I, if I love the music I'm also looking for what that artist is then building around them and that doesn't have to be like I said big numbers of anything and um, it's just showing that there's a real energy and like proactiveness around what the artist is doing um, and that kind of shows that you know they, that they're wanting to achieve and that they're building so that's something I always look for at those early stages. Yeah, I think collaboration, that's interesting with the, the panels that I moderate um, across the industry, um, that collaboration work keeps coming up more and more. And I think at the grassroots level where you may be you're, you're, you're with a DIY level distributor and, and you're not quite sure how you would get to the next level of distributor, looking for other people who are making music or maybe they're not even making music, maybe they're making videos, maybe they're doing quirky stuff on, on TikTok or Instagram who you could collaborate with. And I think increasingly in the industry, yeah, when, when people are seeing artists just, yes, they have their own channels and they have their own music, but they keep popping up everywhere else. That's when people at the next level up of distributor or indeed at a more traditional label start to think, oh, maybe that, that's someone we, sh we should be working with. Um, I'm, I'm going to come to David next and think on the live side. So we're going to talk about the impact of COVID in, in a few minutes. But I mean, if we just think about it more in normal times, let's let's be super optimistic and hope that in the middle of 2021, things are slowly going to start to return to normal on the live side. Um, so I suppose, you know, if you are an early career artist and you're trying to get that side of the business going, I mean, first of all, do you think people should initially put on their own shows? And if so, how do you do that? And then how can you get venues and promoters and festivals interested in, in your live performance? Well, I think, you know, in terms of next year, I don't think it's going to be so different for a young artist than this year the reality is our business probably doesn't fully recover until 2022 um despite all the good news lately there still has to be a rollout um you know and it's unlikely that governments who set policy are going to move at the speed we do as an industry we already know for example that most european governments aren't going to mandate what happens next summer until the end of march and for most festivals for example that's just too late in terms of their when they have to commit large sums of money that they can't currently insure, uh, especially for the reason that's likely to leave them being cancelled. Pre-corona, you know, to go to your question, should you play live? Well, yes, but I, I think there are different degrees of how you should do it. It's very important to get momentum. Um, I think the problem with live music is unless you're a DJ and therefore maybe this, it's just you and one other person in a car, by and large, you will lose money developing your live career long before you'll make money. And the days when record companies would sign early and provide big tour support checks are, you know, gone. Um, there are labels that will support touring. But it, at the end of the day, what you need to do is really concentrate on the local community you're part of. Um, you should at all costs avoid major cities and major showcase venues early on. So if you're a kid in Manchester starting a band, don't even think about coming to London. That's the last place you want to be. You want to be, build your own community, you know, no matter how small. Um, you know, I have one young artist who started her career by singing in a hotel bar, doing covers, 
because that was all that was available to her. But the amount of experience she got from doing that day in, day out for weeks at a time gave her confidence um, and gradually brought her to the attention of a producer who then took her to the next stage. So I think it's very important you look around your local community and you find ways to get yourself seen. It can be a college, it can be a bar, it can be, you know, these days it can even be something streamed on, on Zoom or Twitch or online. Um, but you, you need to have some kind of constituency around you, some kind of community around you before you start trying to get the attention of the business. Um, because the business, unfortunately, similarly, it's not, it's not 40,000 bands a day that we're looking at, but we are getting hundreds and hundreds of submissions a week. And it's, you know, if, you're, if you come to the attention of agents and promoters before you're ready, in a, in a very busy field, you might get passed on very quickly because you're just not ready. And then, you know, whereas if you'd waited another year or two, you'd have a much stronger opportunity of getting their attention, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's two really important points that you raised there. The first one being that point that actually when you're playing at a grassroots level, uh, certainly once you go behind, beyond your hometowns, so you've got travel costs. It's actually really hard to make any money out of life. And I often think that's, I mean, obviously not in 2020, but prior to 2020, I think the narrative in the world was, oh, in the 21st century, you make all your money out of performing live. And obviously, once you reach a certain level of venue, that may well be true. But at the grassroots, it's quite hard to make money out of live. And I always think that's quite depressing for artists starting out, that they keep reading that you make all your money in music out of live performance. But then actually, when you're playing to 100 people in a room, you're probably losing money. And actually, at that point, the live activity is it's much more about building that community, finding the collaborators, building an audience on which the, everything else you do will, will, will subsequently grow. Um, yeah, and also that point about, you know, not immediately going, you know, for the, for the big London venues and, and uh, trying to play in front of the industry until you are ready, until you have a great show and a little bit of a community around you, because almost, you know, people, they, they, the industry wants to take the little community you've created and the momentum you've created and then and then run with it rather than sort of creating that from scratch. Would, would you agree? I think, I think actually one of the reasons why uh, all DJ forms of live music, whether it's from you know, electronic music or grime or whatever. I think the reason why so many more scenes developed in the UK is because often case, the DJ and the promoter would be part of the same group, the same group of people. Um, and so what you would have is you would have a sort of virtuous circle that sustained itself. And that, that was true in the very beginning of the electronic dance scene in the late eighties. The DJ was often the promoter um, or they were a team. And I think you see that in all forms of subcultures across the UK, where these sort of self-supporting communities, everybody does their role. You know, it was very interesting for me reading the Stormzy book, how, you know, all of the people in that crew fulfilled a specific role and they all lifted each other. And I think, again, it speaks to developing a community of people around you. If, if, if you know someone who has a certain skill set and, you know, you're able to, to try and grow together, you know, uh, there is strength in numbers in that sense. And um, I think that's why a lot of sort of bedroom music, for lack of a better word, music that can be created in your home is in some ways easier to get out there if you're part of a scene of people that are all doing the same thing. Whereas for live musicians, it's a much tougher road in the short term, for sure. Yeah, no, and I, and I got out of that is, I mean, we, we often talk about people at the start of their career as being in the DIY stage of their career. And what we mean by that is that they're not working with any traditional music companies, not that they're doing it on their own. Um, and it is very much about building that creative team around you, some of whom will be other musicians, producers, rappers, whatever, but some will be, yeah, the, the people who, who their passion is making video or their passion is creating, you know, some weird images that go really well on social. Okay, the, the last little bit of practical tips before we get going into the, uh, the issues of 2020. Um, let's quickly talk about rights, about copyright, um, and... Um, Let's just, I, I'll start off by saying that as soon as you're recording music and you're getting it up there on, on the platforms and you're creating music, and even once you stop playing live, in all of that music, there's this thing called copyright, which, which is a kind of intellectual property. And actually on the recording and the song side of the business, that, that sits at the heart of the business. And so one thing you can definitely be doing at the outset, as well as getting your recordings out there, as well as building a community and building collaborators, and actually, 
it's when you get collaborators, this all becomes much, much more important, is making sure you're aware of this thing called copyright and you're just sorting everything out in terms of formalizing those rights and then making money out of those rights. So I'm going to come to, to Shawnee next, because obviously this is this is the thing that your, your, your passion is to get everybody to understand this. So maybe just very quickly give us an introduction. I mean, you mentioned PRS in your intro. Some people may know what that is. Some people may not. But just give us a, a quick intro into, OK, what rights are we talking about? And, and how do we formalize those rights? And, and once people start collaborating, what conversations should they be having with their collaborators when it comes to copyright? So I'll sort of like work backwards. So if you're in a studio, you're creating a song, um, it's really important to outline your publishing split. So when we're talking about rights, that's what we're predominantly talking about. Um, the income behind the music is in public performance. Uh, mechanical rights as well as uh, like neighbor rights. So, uh, so, so there are three accounts, main accounts that you need. You need a PRS account, that's going to pay you um, public performance royalties on the publishing side. You need, if you are an artist or a rights holder, you need a PPL account, that's going to pay you um, public performance income for your rights on the recorded side. I hope I'm not throwing people off. And then you need an MCPS account. And that is going to pay you, for example, if you're selling CDs and, and um, vinyls, so physical sales, but it's also a very, very minute part of, of streaming um, physical downloads. Um, but, you know, I can't stress this enough because this is something that I come across all the time and I go mad every single time I go into the studio and it's outlining your publishing splits. You know, I, I pulled up a studio session the other day and they played me the track. I said, yeah, it sounds amazing. So who's getting what? And they all went off and they said, how could you come in here with your bad vibes? And, you know, you want to talk money? And I was like, okay, all right. But like, just, you know, humor me. Who, who's getting what? Everybody started throwing out different numbers. And I said, see, this is why you have this conversation. So we, it took us like 30 minutes, but we figured out the publishing splits, who was going to get what on the record. And you know, like it is industry standard to fill out a split sheet, but I can understand that that's really awkward. I used to always walk with split sheets. Honestly, it's a bit annoying in this day and age. So I literally just have um, everyone send me their emails and on an email thread, we say the you know, date time song was recorded, um, each writer involved, and then have everyone email back and acknowledge and agree to the splits. Um, and why it's so important as well, because if you register a work, on PRS and the splits are all over the place, nobody gets paid because, you know, there can't be 120% of a song. So that's one of the major issues I, I, I face and it's one of my biggest headaches. It really drives me mad when people don't do it. Um, before you get on to your next tip, I'm going to I'm going to also recap what you've just said because I know that it's so important. We want to make sure yeah. that everyone has, has sure. followed. So yeah, so when you create a piece of music, um, there's a copyright in that music, but if you've collaborated, you're going to share the copyright, and so that and, and that's the publishing rights that we're talking about here. So you need to be really clear who in the room is being cut into this copyright, and then what percentage is everybody getting? Um, and then once you've agreed that, yes, I have that exchange of email that Shawnee just talked about, and then you can log it with the music industry through this thing called PRS, log it in their database. Um, and then it's remembering that the sound recording is separate to that. So, so who is owning the sound recording? Often that will be the main artist, or if they're signed to a label, it will be the label. But again, it, it's, it's whatever you agree. And I think the crucial thing is that what copyright law says is, when you create a piece of music, there's a copyright in it. And when you record something, there's a copyright in it. But that's all copyright law says. So then you've got to agree who's getting the rights, how you're gonna share it, and then log it with the music industry, which here in the UK, you would do for songs with PRS and then with recordings, you, you would do it with, with PPL. Yeah, um, there's a, a final tip that I, I want to give everyone. Um, and that's be careful when people are offering you free studio time because, you know, like, like Chris said, it, it is what you agreed, but typically it's whoever financed the record has the rights to the masters. So, you know, technically we can agree that's recording costs. Um, so if I own a studio and you come and record, and then let's say I, I hit you with a cheeky invoice and you don't pay it, I'm entitled to own that record. Same with if you're not paying producers. Um, I, I get that all the time and I'm always scaring, especially the major labels, if they're paying late, like look, this, I can promise you this is our song if you don't pay the producer. So that's just a tip that I wanna give everyone. Yeah, really important point that, that um, in the absence of an agreement, 
there are what we call default ownership rules. So if, if you don't agree, then the law says, okay, well, whoever wrote the song owns the copyright in the song, and then whoever paid for the recording owns the recording. But we don't want to rely on default ownership rules because they're ambiguous and they're confusing. They're also different from country to country. I'm aware there's people tuning in from all over the world. The rules differ from country to country, but providing you agree what you're going to do, then all is good. I just saw somebody in the uh, chat also say, in terms of logging splits, you mentioned that you could have a formal sheet of paper, everyone signs, although that feels a little bit too formal. You could do an exchange of emails, which is what Shawnee does. There are some apps, somebody mentioned orderly in the chat. There are some apps that can help with that process. No, no one likes having this conversation, <laughs> but it's so important that you do. Um, because as Shawnee said, there are massive songwriters who are currently getting zero Spotify money because 20 years ago, they didn't sort this out. Um, so make sure you sort this out. Um, I'm going to come to Crystal next. I mean, you mentioned your legal background and that you you uh, worked on the, on the legal side, both for, 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 for an artist directly and then now on the other side of, of, of the fence in, in the label. I mean, in terms of formalizing agreements, in terms of you know having contracts between collaborators or between artists and the companies they're working with. I mean, at what point is that something that people should be worrying about? And does it mean that a lawyer is going to have to be involved in that process? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, a lawyers are always going to be needed from kind of day one um, as an artist. Um, even if you're taking something as simple as a feature agreement, obviously, um, as everyone's been saying, unless you um, get the rights assigned over from the featured artists, they will own part of the copyright um, on on the track. So it's always best um, as an artist to try and get all those paper, all those things done before you actually try and record the song. Uh, sorry, not record, to release the song on Spotify, or whatever, to avoid you getting a takedown notice from somebody else who does have a legitimate claim to the copyright in the underlying, um, an underlying track, but arguably also um, someone may have a claim on the recorded master copyright. Um, for, for example, a producer still has a right, can still have a legitimate claim. So producers, mixers, anyone that does actually contribute and has some sort of claim of authorship on the track. So I think it's always important to get a lawyer involved as early as possible, just so that also just so that someone can try and explain to you why you're entering into these agreements. Why do you need to enter into a future agreement more? Well, because the most important thing is you need an assignment of the rights. If you are the, 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 the number one or the primary artist, you want all the other featured people and the producers to sign over any rights that they may have. Um, and same thing, even when I'm working as a label, you know, I want to make sure that everyone has assigned the rights. If the if the artist is signed to another label, I want to make sure that that label signs over any rights that they may have so that I make sure I have all the correct bundle of rights in my hand before I go over to a DSP and say, here's my track and let's get it out. So I think it's always important. Um, and all things as well, you know, if you've got brand deals, um, for someone to try and understand the, you know, the nitty gritties of that deal, um, how you're getting paid, how else can you get paid for from this, from this deal? So I think lawyers probably should be number two after you get a manager. I think maybe try and onboard the lawyer on, um, just so that you understand the business. You know, they can maybe prepare you a, doc a suite of documents, like a template of documents, if you don't want to pay someone um, going forward on a like a retainer basis, maybe they can draft you like a suite of documents, a future featured agreement, a featured artist agreement, maybe a production agreement, mix agreement, um, just so that you have what you need from day one. Yeah, and I suppose there's the whole thing there, isn't there? I mean, obviously, um, at, at the complete starting point, then you probably can't afford a lawyer necessarily. I mean, some music lawyers do actually work with artists almost on a pro bono basis at the start. But step one is everything that Shawnee was saying. It's just making sure everything is agreed and written down um, and that you're aware of the different kinds of rights. And, and there are people out there in the industry like Shawnee who will help you understand that and make sure you're asking the right questions. But certainly, as Crystal was saying there, as soon as you, I mean, I know what a lawyer lawyers will say is, as soon as you're signing a contract, which is a long-term commitment, so it isn't just we're going to do something for a few weeks, when you're signing a contract that requires exclusivity, so you're going to only be able to work with this company, or yes, you are assigning your rights for a long period of time, or maybe even life for copyright, when any of those things are happening, that's when probably you do need to get some legal advice. Although there is always the challenge of, of who pays for that. But as I say, there are some music lawyers who will offer at least a little bit of advice, almost free of charge at the start. Um, I'm going to ask one more copyright question 
um, which has come in on, on, on the thing. Uh, and then we'll get into the 2020 debates. Um, but uh, maybe ask Crystal this, but maybe also get Shawnee's thing. This always comes up, which is if you're using somebody else's beats in a track or maybe you're sampling something in a track, you know, any tips on what you should be doing to to you know make sure that when you release the track that you're not going to get in trouble down the line? Yeah. Uh, for samples, get them cleared. Um, um, and that actually means getting specific permission getting from whoever specific, owns the copyright yeah. that you can use it. Yeah, so for samples, you'd normally go and look at, you know, sometimes you can just go look at the credit um, on Spotify, for example. That's a great tool to see actually who has writing credits um, and who's the producer, because depending on what you actually sample from the track, um, will will actually um, dictate who you need to go and get the rights from. Um, so, for example, if it is something that is um, just, you, let's say you've just sampled the beat, but not the actual lyrics, then, you know, you'd normally go to, if the person, if the track was released by a label, go to the label um, so that you get a sample sample clearance on the master right level or the, what I would say, the recorded the recorded level um, and then you need to go get a publishing clearance as well from the producer or whoever whoever else has writing credits on that track but you know if 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 you've also got for example a, a sample of a bit of the track so maybe if you've got the main chorus being looped in into your sample then you know that's a bit more complicated because you would need um, the writers involved in that track as well to give you the sample clearance um, and again that's just because someone does have rights and a claim to that, to that, to that kind of copyrighted material that you've embedded into your track. And sometimes I would say is, I would say it's more of a producer's um, thing to do. I think I I would normally try push down the producer, but you know, as the artist and and that's your work and it's you know it's your reputation and it's your income. I would say for the writer to also keep, you know, keep keep your eyes on that as well and if the producer is not willing to do it then obviously you're going to have to go do it yourself um and and again if if you've taken someone's beat for example from youtube or or whatever then you know they still do have a claim to the song because they are the producer they do have a publishing right and arguably if you don't have um an assignment of rights they still have some sort of claim on your on the recorded side as well so i'm always a bit weary about when people just go and grab stuff off YouTube because sometimes you have entered into um, a license that they have on YouTube. Sometimes these producers have like their own kind of one page licenses, which are not great. Like if you look at them, some of them will say that, you know, they, they'll limit downloads to a hundred thousand downloads or it's not for commercial use or, you know, it's just not the right license for you to use if you actually want to release your track commercially. So I'm always a bit weary when people bring, bring those type of tracks to us as a label or if I'm working with an independent artist because those licenses are just not that great and sometimes you can't even get in contact with the producer because you know they're just saying pay your 40 dollars or whatever and you and, and you get the rights so I'm always a bit weary yes it is it is a tricky one um and and um it, but but it, it is a big issue, and I think yes, when you're when you're grabbing beats off a website somewhere, it is always remember. Unfortunately, it probably means those terms and conditions that you've never read in your life. Um, is if you're, if you're going to put those beats in the track and you're going to put the track on Spotify, you probably need to go and read those terms and conditions and see what it says, and make sure that it's not saying, "Oh, we're going to own your track." Because if that track goes big, you don't want the, the person who made the beats coming around and saying, well, hang on a second, that's my money. So it is just being aware of, of this right stuff. But loads of great questions coming in, but I'm going to quickly do some 2020 topics um, and then we'll ask as many questions. Oh, go on. Did... Thank you, Chris. I just wanted to quickly say something. Oh, yeah, sorry. I did say you were going to, didn't I? No, that's all right. But I, I would just say with independent artists, like don't use samples, I say, because it's just not worth it. Um, like this week alone, you know, I've got... Like I celebrated, let's just say that, because I got a sample cleared. It was an old rap song with literally 10 writers. And it's it's a nightmare because you have to get permission from every... Even if they only had, I think they had 5% each, something like that. You have to get permission from every single writer and producer on the publishing side. Masters are usually easier to clear from the publishing. And it's, it's a headache. So, I mean, unless you've got the time and the resources or somebody to chase it for you, I say just avoid samples because you don't want to end up in court with a copyright case. But sorry, I just wanted to quickly say that. 
Yeah, so I suppose a quick recap for both what Crystal and Shorty said there is remembering there's those two copyrights, there's both the recording copyright and the, and the publishing or the song copyright, and the latter probably has multiple owners. So you're going to have to not just do one deal for recording and one for song, there's a very high chance you're going to have to do two for song or three for song. Or there are some tracks now that have 12 co-writers, so you might have to do 12 uh, different deals just just to get the song rights covered. Um, want to quickly talk about 2020 stuff. So I'm going to come back to David because you've already given us um, sort of your um, sort of reality check on when you think the live industry is, is going to slowly return to normal. Um, I mean, we, we don't need to really go over what's happened since March. We know it's been catastrophic for the live industry. You know, most of the live industry has basically been in shutdown since March. A few socially distant shows here in the UK, a few countries where things have started to get back to normal. But I mean, it has been catastrophic. So, so your prediction is that, that 2021 is going to be the year where the vaccine rolls out and we start to work out what's happening. But really, we're talking about 2022 to get back to full capacity shows. I mean, in terms of what the live industry will look like when it comes back, I mean, will it have radically changed? Or is it just a case of when we can finally get back to full capacity, we basically go back to where we were in 2019? Well, let's start with the most positive aspects of what is generally a really depressing subject. Um, the most optimistic thing I can say is that the one bit of good news that's been consistent since March is the incredibly low number of refunds. Um, I actually have tours that I haven't moved once. I've actually moved twice. I have one tour that I've moved twice that has 200,000 tickets sold. And by the time the tour plays, it will have been an, a year and a half after it was supposed to happen very low levels of refunds globally. Um, in some cases, only a few percent. And in, in those cases, the tickets have since then been resold. So the optimism and the determination of the public to go back to live music ha has just been so robust. And it's the thing we're all holding on to. What will be different, I think, by the time we get back, and I don't think there's much point speculating on what the rules might be, temperature testing, you know, uh, reduced capacity, which by and large is a, an impractical uh, and unworkable solution for most venues of all kinds. I, I think the real problem is going to be, if you take the UK, you know, well over 200,000 people employed, directly employed in venues, concerts, festivals, and so on, specialists, promoters, you know, supply companies, I mean, er everything you can imagine. So many of those businesses are not going to survive another year of not being able to trade. So I think the biggest difference in the sort of sh the short to midterm is that we're just going to be missing a lot of venues, a lot of you know independent promoters or specialist staff at larger companies that they can no longer afford to keep on. Um, you know those riggers who are so important for big productions that have had to go and get jobs on building sites to pay for food for their families. Like there's going to be a big gap. I think there's also potentially going to be a generation gap in the the artists who would be breaking through at this point if the business hadn't come to a complete halt. And I think three to five years from now, we may be looking at our business going, where's all the new talent? And the truth is these two years when they would have come through and they would have gained momentum and they would have grown up with their own age group of gen and generation, there's going to be some suffering there. So the difference is going to be a lack of professional people in what was a fairly mature business at the point it went down and it's going to take time to get back to that and I think if you are a young artist who was expecting it to be your moment this year next year you know it's probably tougher for you than it even is normally um, and we may perhaps have less new artists breaking through um, which is, is not something I feel great about but I think if we're not thinking about that, then we're not able to then come up with solutions for how to get through that, because there's probably other ways to help those artists if we all put our minds to it. What's your take on the growth of live streaming and concert streaming that has definitely taken um, off in recent months? Yeah, I mean, it, that is know, a long term I, thing. It's, it's going to be yeah. part of the experience long term or is it a temporary blip? I, I don't I think it's somewhere in the middle. I mean, we now have a dedicated group of agents in the company who only deal with the virtual space, the streaming space. For, for people watching this to know, there are about 75 legitimate platforms out there right now that offer streaming of some kind or other. I would say about 15 to 20 of those monetize correctly and have the right, either the right marketing and ticketing structure or they're open to having that help given to them. And the rest are all in various stages of 
you know, growing as, as new businesses. Um, and we have dozens of those deals coming through. I think when live music does come back, I think there will be less interest in streaming, but streaming will survive for those artists who've understood what kind of a medium it is. It's not a medium for replicating a live concert. It's a medium for creating a unique experience. So the, the most successful streams to date have been ones where a unique, think of it as a one-off TV show or a, a special event, something that you can't actually see live. Those are proving to be the more successful events. I also think it takes live performance into more places in the world than you would perhaps be able to tour yourself. So for example, next weekend, Dua has her live stream. We've already sold tickets in 120 countries around the world. Now that's a pretty extraordinary statistic. Um, and I think you're gonna see more and more of that. So I think as a replacement for the live business, not even in the conversation. As another way of artists communicating something interesting about themselves, finding a way to reach out. You know, there is two really interesting smaller uh, streaming sites, one called uh, Moment House and one called uh, Noon Chorus. And they are specializing in unusual left of center artists who, who want to do something a little quirkier, a little artier. You know, if, if the only platform for doing that was performing live, it would be very, very difficult. So if platforms like that come along as another way of young artists being able to express themselves in a different way, uh, I think as an industry, we will continue to support those companies and try and keep them in business. But, it, you know, it's a parallel service, but it's not a replacement and never could be. The other thing that's happened this year, because live went into shutdown and there were many artists for whom that was how they made most of their money or a big chunk of their money, it's really put the spotlight back on the money that comes in from the streaming services. And we've seen in multiple countries, some artists come forward and say that streaming just doesn't pay enough, that the money that comes through from, from a Spotify or whatever um, isn't enough. Um, and it certainly isn't compensating for the lost money on the live side. I mean, I'm going to come back to, to, to Muna and then I might also ask this question of Eve. I mean, what is your take on the whole streaming doesn't pay enough debate? I mean, is that true or is it just the way certain artists structure the recording side of their business means that they're not seeing the benefit of, of, of streaming money? So let's start with Muna on that. Um... I don't know. I mean, it's such a it's such a big question, I guess, like an ongoing debate about streaming. I think one thing that is worth bearing in mind is that, um, you know, earning from your streams is also dependent on the contracts that you have in place with either rights holders like your label or your distributor. And so I think that's something to bear in mind and keep an eye for, because if you are not in the right deals or you have a terrible deal, you would probably also see terrible streams, uh, royalties as a result. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, Yeah, I'd be curious to just open this up with Eve as well and see, yeah, what she thinks. I mean, I suppose that, but that is the key point, is it isn't in this debate, is that when money flows from Spotify to an artist, it passes through somebody else's bank account. And depending yeah. on the deal the artist has done with that someone, it may be that 100% of the money is passed on to the artist, or it may be that 15, 20% of the money is passed on. And that's going to make a big difference in terms of the benefit that the artist sees. Exactly. So I think that is just something to bear in mind. And that's probably something that's overlooked as people are thinking about these streaming services and going, oh, I know that Spotify pays this, this amount X for a stream. But I think it's really crucial to bear in mind the deals that you are um, putting in place to get your music out and and yeah, the terms of those contracts that you are deciding to sign and understanding what that will mean for your, the royalties you're going to receive. I mean, let's get Eve's perspectives on this. I mean, is, is it that Spotify just doesn't pay enough or is it all about how you structure the recording side of your business as an artist and how much your business partner is taking of the money? I think it's a, it's a really interesting conversation because I think there's still a lot for us to, or I feel like there's still a lot of learning I'm doing and sort of how those deals work and when those deals were set up. Something I do find interesting is the difference between the publishing income you get from streaming and the difference between the master's income that you get from streaming. And the, the percentage there is very, yeah, is, is very different. And um, that's something that I think is, I mean, it would be great to see sort of more of a balance between those or it being more weighted to more income going to the artists and the writers. Um, 
However, like what Muna said, it's for me, it's really down to like the deals. And I think that there's such there's just such more of a focus on these days of looking at the deals, even if it's really early on for you as an artist and you're doing your first distribution deal or your first label, traditional label deal. I think streaming and looking at I guess the wording around streaming within that contract is so important. It's looking out for things like digital administration fees and wording that's like, okay, where is that little bit of percentage going? Is that going to me as the artist or is that going within the label or the distributor? Um, but it feels like there's much more of a conversation around it these days, even if it's really early on in those initial deals. Um, yeah, so I feel like I'm still learning in that area too, but something I always, um, encouraged by or like artists are looking at that and asking their lawyers and their managers early on about those conversations around streaming. I, I think sorry could I just add a point here which is I, I find it I find it a very interesting conversation that we have when it says our, our streaming platform is playing enough because I think we need to kind of take ourselves out of that very subjective question and look at the business that is streaming in itself um, because if you remember, it's not like physical sales where your money is dependent on, it's a di there's a direct correlation on how much you sell. I think if you remember with streaming now, we have um, streaming platforms that have a finite amount of money every month, i.e. what they get from us as customers or what they get from ads revenues or what they get from whatever. And then they're having to split that up from an infinite amount of streams. So if you look at someone like Drake who could stream how many times a month and then you start to work out, well, how much does a stream actually, what is a stream actually worth and what is it valued? So I think it's we still look at streaming from the kind of physical point of view, which is saying that a stream is worth X when actually a stream might be worth something different in one month compared to how many releases we have, how many people are streaming compared to what a stream might be. If, you know, if it's a slow month and Drake hasn't released and no one, there's no big artist. So I think it's, we have to also, as a consumer, I think as artists also have to look at it from a consumer point of view is, um, you are paying $9.99 a month. How much are you streaming in that month? So then how much from a personal level, how much would you value a stream? based on how much you are streaming. So it's very weird because I think everyone looks at it from a per stream basis or from a, you know, this is how much one stream should be, should, should, should be worth, but that's not how the business is working, unfortunately, because it's, it's a very, it's just a very different business structure. It's, it's very different from what we're used to. And I think streaming, um, um, the streaming platforms are also having to deal with how do we actually value that and then if you look at the fact that actually they get all of their content well most of their content comes from three major labels and having to split the income across those three major labels it's just it's just a very complicated thing to deal with right now. Yeah I think the, the complicated word is another word to, to point out someone very generously in the chat mentioned I wrote a book about this called Dissecting the Digital Dollar it's quite a long book and the reason it's quite a long book is it's, there isn't actually a per stream rate how much you earn per stream depends on various different criteria and so it is you know it's, and there are multiple layers of complexity there's the complexity of how the money gets shared out at Spotify then there's the complexity of what happens to the money as it flows through the, the distributors and the labels and on the song side through publishers and collecting societies. But I suppose part of this debate, I mean, Shawnee, you mentioned this earlier, so I'm going to come to you with this before we go on to the questions that have been coming in from the audience. Um, I mean, obviously, Kanye West has, has started a, 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 his mission is to completely change the way the record industry works, completely change how record deals work. And I mean, it, in some ways, it is linked to this conversation. The fact that when you sign a record deal, you need to be really clear what you're getting and what you're giving up. And, and that, you know, sometimes artists give up a lot with that record deal. And, and what is your take on you know, are record deals generally unfair or is it that record deals back when Kanye was starting out were unfair, but actually things are slowly starting to improve? What, what's your take on the whole Kanye debate? Kanye. One, I don't think he really wants to change the record business. I think he just wants to change his circumstance. That's one first point. But yes, I do think, especially the way the contracts were set up, it, you know, in his days, which was maybe you signed early 2000s, that those kind of royalty splits were standard, you know, it was like 18% with escalations. Now, average, it's maybe around 23, 24%, uh, maybe with some escalations. But then you have to remember, like, you don't 
get what's fair. You get what you negotiate. That's my thing with, with this this debate. So you know, someone like H, like a huge artist, can go into. I'm well, I'm sure you signed a deal now, but he can go in and, and say, well, do you know what? I only want to go 50 50. And you know, I've seen. I can't. I can't necessarily say who, but I've seen. You know, some really good deals. And, and then you have to remember record deals now you're not signing you know the rights to your music for the life of the copyright most of them are, are licensing deals so usually it's just for a term so you know yes i think they are quite greedy they they are unfair but you know you can make it work and make it make sense for you and then you've got companies like caroline international sony ada orchard that offer label services or, or able where eve's at and you know the, the the agreement's totally different. The the rights stay with the artist. So yeah, and then also you can always renegotiate your contract as well. That's another thing. And I've seen that when I, when I worked at Universal Music, there was a band that signed you know quite a terrible deal in like the eighties, and they successfully renegotiated their contracts for a higher royalty split. So like the answer is yes and no, basically. And again, it's, it's more complexity. That what, What's great about being an artist in 2020 is it isn't just that there is a record deal and you either sign with a major or an indie. There are now many different ways you can structure your relationship with a label, whether it's major or indie or with a distribution company or label services company. Um, the Music Managers Forum, of which Kwame is the vice chair, um, I worked on a thing called the Deals Guide of the MMF, which you can download for free from the MMF's website that explains all the different ways you can go about it. But the general rule is the more you get from your label or distributor, the more you have to give up. Um, so the more, more money you want, the more marketing you want, the more global support you want, realistically, the more you're going to have to give up in terms of rights I, and royalties. See, I disagree with that point. Okay, you, you say I that and then I'm gonna, you, tell me why, <laughs> just to know why, and then I'm going to ask some questions that have come in. Yeah, I think maybe because I sit in a label and obviously I've sat on both sides, right? So I've worked with, when I was working with Easy, he was arguably one of the biggest Afrobeat artists at the time. Um, and exactly what Shawnee said, um, if I tell you my deal with Columbia was a three-page document, which I dictated all the rules. Even now, sometimes my boss comes back and like, what was the point here? Because there were certain things we just didn't negotiate. It was just, this is all he's going to do, take it or leave it. And when you're in a bidding war with three labels, you can do that. Um, so yeah, he has certainly different terms from what other people do. But I think um, one thing as well, again, whenever people have this very subjective conversation on something that which is quite an objective question, it's again, when you're signing into a label, you are inserting yourself into a business that you need to try and understand. So the reason why I disagree, I said, I don't think it's necessarily if you want more marketing or whatever, you have to give up more. It's either you do a licensing or you don't, and it's fine. I've been at Columbia for two years and I haven't done a deal where anybody's given up their master rights, no, no matter how much of an advance we gave or no matter how much marketing we gave. But one thing that you also need to understand is that we are taking a commercial gamble. We are taking a big commercial risk on you because especially if you're looking at a development artist, you sometimes they don't have any streams, but we are actually taking a gamble. We believe that um, you will do well as an artist, which means that I have a, a, a building full of people that I need to pay, right? So I need to pay the publicist, I need to pay the marketing people, the accountants that are gonna send you royalties, someone like me that's gonna negotiate everything for you. On top of the fact that I paid you in advance and we're gonna give you a, roy we're gonna give you a, um, a marketing fund, which is not recoupable. So I think sometimes there's always these conversations based on, urban legend and urban myths of all oh, the 360 i've never done a 360 at columbia or or you know you're recouping everything you don't recoup marketing that's our commercial risk so when we're spending 50 60 grand on a video that's sony's commercial risk that this video may do what it needs to do with the video may not do what it needs to do um so in, and then you have to remember um and then someone said, here, it's a loan. No, it's not a loan. We're never going to come and ask you for the money back. It's a commercial risk that we're taking. And you need to remember, we're aggregating that risk. So in the building, I'm taking that risk on 100 artists. Um, and, I'm, you know, with business, with great risk comes great reward. And I know it, it may seem unfair to artists, but you need to remember that we have given you an advance on what we believe are going to be your future earnings. And it's not something that we're ever going to, go and say I want the money back I've ne never have I heard anybody say 
well, you know, you haven't recouped and you need to pay me back your $200,000. We don't even sue artists. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not the done thing to sue an artist for, you know, them not doing, them not honouring part of their contract or whatever. We did a commercial deal. We took a commercial gamble. If it didn't work, it didn't work. So I think sometimes my frustrations as a label person is a lot of these urban myths go into how, um, certain artists feel about a label because you know if someone can name me a truly international superstar that doesn't have a label or isn't signed then you know then I'll be surprised but that's the price that people pay when they understand they want to be taken to that next level and you know you do your deal and your label gets you to a point and then maybe you can leave and amplify that yourself um so someone said AJ Tracy but I mean AJ Tracy's on our level but when I'm talking about that I'm talking about global superstars, the Drakes, the Nicki Minaj's, the Ariana Grande's, who are, as Shawnee said, are in positions that you could probably go negotiate an amazing, an amazing royalty rate. Um, and I, you know, I've never heard someone like Drake come out and really have these type of conversations because he understands he's probably negotiated the best deal for himself and he's in a great position as an artist. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. Yes, yes. The, the more you get, the more you might have to give up. But it's all about the negotiation. And it's about your value as an artist, the value of your fan base. And that's where this getting the momentum going yourself is really important. The more momentum you can build for yourself and then with your collaborators and then with a manager, the better deal that you're going to negotiate. And we are running out of time. We've done a really bad job of getting some questions in. So I'm going to ask a couple of very quick questions before we wrap up. So here's a question. Actually, it's, it's just for Eve. So this is someone who's currently recording their debut album and wanted to send the mix to master demo tracks from the album to some publishers, a &Rs, and publishers and labels before putting it up on, on Spotify and releasing it. Um, hoping there might be some interest in supporting the release. Would you recommend that somebody do that? Is it worth sending your music to a &Rs before releasing it to see if you can get some support? And that was specifically for Eve. Well, I think coming to things like this is great. And I guess having people that are quite targeted to send it to that you think like your style of music, work with similar artists in a similar field, I think that's the best way to do it. And um, I wouldn't always say that sort of that, you know, blanket email to just every single a &R contact you can get, because there are some websites that, that sell those contacts. And I'm always a bit skeptical of that because you'll be hitting up a lot of people who might not work with artists similar to yourself. But if you can strategically sort of find on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on, on Instagram, and people that you feel like are champions of what you do, um, then I think always send a DM, just do it. I mean, sometimes you don't get a reply, but you never know, you might be hitting someone up who actually is really scouting for new music and, um, and looking for new music. Similar questions come in from Muna, which is we talked about the, having the hierarchy of distributors and the distributors who do a bit more work than, than just the simple distribution. And one person said it sometimes feels like the only way you can get the higher level distribution is if somebody introduces you to the distributor or there's somebody internally. I mean, are there things people can be doing um, either approaching distributors or just other activity that might make a company like yours say, OK, they're currently with TuneCore, but actually we'd like to work with them on a slightly higher level is there anything they could be doing to make them attractive to you yeah i think it's similar to kind of what eve was saying at the beginning is like making sure you're sort of doing the work yourself around your music um uh collaborating with the right people um putting it out you know and doing doing as much of the work you can yourself or around your stuff and it's not necessarily about making sure you have loads of followers and loads of plays it's just we want to see that you're actively pushing your music and your creativity, I guess. Um, so that that would be my my recommendation. Yeah, so it comes back to this idea of getting the momentum going, getting some collaborations going, so that then people are seeing that you're, that you're doing stuff, and that yeah. then they think, okay, if I I could get involved in that, and I could take them to the next level because they've already got the momentum going. Yeah, I think we at Say Fifty One always want to see that artists are being active themselves. Um, and that is the best way that we can then come in and try and assist and assist them to hopefully get to the next level. Um, I've got coming back to Crystal for the next question. It's, it's a relatively simple, short question, except I think the answer is probably it depends, which is we talked about getting legal advice relatively early on. And so someone said, how much does a music lawyer usually cost? Yeah, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I mean, it's a music 
the music law firm, if you're working with someone that works in a law firm, obviously the structure will depend on, um, the pricing structure will depend on the seniority, right? So um, if you're, if you, if, if you've got a, let's say a trainee solicitor that's working for you, um, the rate is going to be very different from if you've got a partner working for, for you. Um, and that, that's the kind of structure all over the legal, um, the legal landscape. Because even when I was in corporate law, my rate was very different from um, my partner's rate. So I think depending on if the person's independent or not, then, you know, independent lawyers, I'm not sure if I know a lot, um, their rates, I guess, is just based on their time. But if you're working with someone in the firm, then it's always dictated on the firm. And maybe if they can be a bit flexible with the with it, but maybe you expect to pay maybe 100 or 200 an hour, um, depending on seniority experience um, with lawyers. And then I would say, I mean, there are some lawyers in the big music law firms who do work more on a pro bono basis at the outset. Their assumption being that when you get the record deal, or you get the publishing deal, then I'm going to make my money. Um, and then the other thing also is, yeah, when you if you are paying that kind of rate, which I mean, a lot of people tuning in will be like, oh my God, that's a lot of money, is using their time very wisely. So don't go to the lawyer and say, I need a deal. It's going to the lawyer and saying, I've been to Ultimate Seminar, I've learned what questions need to be answered. This is what we're kind of agreeing. Now, can you just look at that and tell me about the red flags, tell me about the things I should be worried about, et cetera. Kind of almost limited link to this. I've got a question, I'm gonna ask Shawnee this question. We were talking about splits on songs and publishing splits and putting that into PRS and someone's saying, you know, is, is it common for like managers or, or even a label to try and get a split on the publishing? Or is that something that you should you should you should be no yeah. no it's only the people who are actually involved in the in writing the music exactly you shouldn't be giving up your publishing splits to, to anyone so no and don't work with anyone that tries to do that you are but no um, and then someone has just asked us to, to 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 go back again through the difference between PRS and PPL so that, that's a really important point so let's just do that yeah. one last time so the the most important point is that well for one um when you listen to a song you'll listen to two copyrights there's the master recordings and the publishing so that's why you know i'll say i switched from the recorded industry to the publishing industry so the public performance income which is income from public music usage you get that on the publishing side and that's paid by prs and then you get it on the recorded side and that's paid via ppl Okay, yes. So it's just getting your head around the difference between publishing yeah. and recordings or songs or masters. And unfortunately, we all use different words to mean the same thing, which makes it complicated. And but when you're to... sort of writing music, that's PRS, that's songs. And when you're recording music, that's masters, that's recording, and, and that's PPL. And sorry, can I just add a point to sh what Shawnee was saying? Because I read that question as well. And when they were also asked about PPL, and that gets a little bit more complicated if you are an independent artist or signed to a label. So if you're signed to a label or actually not even just signed to a label, if you've entered into an exclusive um, licensing agreement with someone, PPL will treat that person as the rights holder. So PPL will split the income. So let's say if you've got £100 in the pot, they split it. So 50% goes to the rights holder, 50% goes to the featured performers it's, it's, it's because the income is based on who owns the rights and who's actually performing. Now, if you're an independent artist, those rights are combined and you'll get 100% of the pot because you're both the rights holder and you are the, the featured performer. Mm -hmm. But if you've signed, let's say, a label agreement or an exclusive licensing agreement, PPL will treat the label as the rights owner and they will get that 50%. So that's, that's the kind of added complication with PPL. Yeah, and so if you are a self-releasing artist, you're putting out your music yourself, um, I think one of the messages of all of today is as an artist, as a music maker, you have to wear an awful lot of hats. So not only are you a songwriter or a beat maker or a lyricist, not only are you a recording artist, not only are you a performer, until you have business partners in place, you are also a label and you are also a publisher and you are also a promoter and you are also an agent. And then as those business partners come on board, then you can hand over that side of what you're doing. And, and the technical point there is, yeah, when you join PPL, you actually are wearing two hats and you join once as a label and once as a performer and then the money gets split. But when you're self-released, it doesn't matter. You get all the money. But as soon as you've got a label on board, they become the label. And so you're only going to get the, the performer side of the money moving forward. Um, so, yes, it's 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 whenever you are dealing with anything in the industry as a self-managed, self-releasing artist, 
it's always saying, okay, what hat am I wearing today? Am I a label today? Am I a publisher today? Am I an agent today? Or are you an artist today? It's nice when you know, obviously your ultimate ambition is you get so many business partners in place that you can just focus on, on making the music. Although to be honest with you, there will still be an entrepreneurial element to what you do. Um, and that whole thing about, you know, getting the right deals, working with the right people, that's a partly about taking control anyway our time is now up so hopefully over the last hour and a half we've helped you to navigate and understand this thing called the music business to know your business as an artist and all the different people you might be working with um obviously there's lots more content still to come on the ultimate seminar um i think kwame is probably going to take over from me and say a little bit more but i'm just going to quickly wrap up by saying thank you to my panelists thank you so much for joining us today um we've really appreciated your insights on on the industry in general and specifically on some of the big debates of 2020 um i hope you found it useful you can check me out uh, um or cmu you should all sign up we do a daily bulletin that explains what's happening in the music industry so if you go to completemusicupdate.com there you go that's my quick plug out of the way 